When Carolus Linnaeus essentially invented taxonomy in the early 1700s, his original system placed every organism within these seven ranking categories, going from the most general to the most specific, being species, of course. Since that time, we've realized that the more you study anything, the more complicated it always turns out to be, and having only seven ranks were not enough. So they further divided these into a superfamily, subgenus, parv order, infraclass, and so on, even adding a whole other rank just 20 years ago, before abandoning the Linnaean concept of ranks altogether and changing to a cladistic system. Now, we still use these original divisions, but only as signposts in what turned out to be a much more complex network than Linnaeus could account for. Linnaeus had no concept of evolution, so it couldn't have occurred to him that as we move from the broadest and most inclusive category through each of the subsequent subsets, that we're also moving through time, marking moments in geologic history, and that each new division changes faster than the last one did. To recap the series so far, the first couple episodes talked about when life began over 3.77 billion years ago, and then perhaps partially conglomerated to become the endosymbiotic domain Eukarya as much as a billion years later. Episode 3 went through a half dozen named clades of unicellular microbes to get to the multicellular dawn of Kingdom Animalia, which brings us another billion years or so closer to where we are now. The next couple episodes covered another handful of clades up to the phylum Chordata, and that brings us up to the Cambrian, the first period of the Paleozoic era only a half billion years ago. The next 17 episodes covered another 34 clades transitioning from the earliest chordates into the origin of the class Mammalia. And this was in the Triassic, the first period of the Mesozoic era, a mere couple hundred million years ago. The last dozen episodes covered the next 13 clades, which finally bring us up to our taxonomic order, which we'll talk about in a moment. Aside from merely discussing our evolution into and through these classifications, each episode of this series has also tried to describe something about the world around us. The type of climate that our ancestors lived in, the other species that were emerging beside them, and occasionally significant extinction level events. And we've come to another big one called the KT extinction, popularly considered to be the second worst yet most famous extinction event in the entire history of life on Earth. The cause is commonly attributed to an impact from space, a comet or meteor about the size of Deimos, the smallest moon of Mars. And this planetoid, called the KT Impactor, was six to nine miles in diameter, weighing maybe 120,000 tons, traveling at 20 kilometers a second or 20 times faster than a rifle bullet. The numbers are incomprehensible in human experience. How could you envision the resulting explosion being a billion times more powerful than the Hiroshima bomb? It struck the northern shore of the Yucatan Peninsula, less than 100 miles from the famous pyramids of Chichen Itza, where I was just last week. This photo was taken just outside the rim of the Chicxulub impact crater, which was, at the moment of impact, 60 miles wide and 30 miles deep. The scientists initially said that this happened between 65 and 66 million years ago, but their ever-improving estimates no more precisely say that it happened 66 million 38,000 years ago, give or take 11,000 years. Over that amount of time, the original crater has been filled in and buried by accumulated sediment, but it is still visible in the measurable differences in gravitational fields and in the distribution of cenotes, a network of associated sinkholes like this one, the beautiful Cenote Hubiku in Temazon, Yucatan. Both at the impact site and radiating away from it are quartz crystals showing structural patterns of significant shock from impact. In the surrounding Gulf of Mexico, there is also evidence of the 100 meter high tsunamis that would have resulted from such a large impact so close to the shore that at least part of it was actually in the water. And the amount of earth displaced would still have caused a substantial tsunami anywhere near the shore. Evidence of this impact is found all over the globe in the form of a layer of iridium dust which precisely divides the end of the Cretaceous and the beginning of the Tertiary period, which is why this is called the KT extinction. Iridium is a relatively rare element on Earth, but one that is notably common in meteors. Yet there is a thin blanket of it all around the world, specifically marking the KT boundary, where dinosaurs, ammonites, and other organisms are found in abundance below that line, but none at all have ever been found above it. We still have fossils, but they're much fewer and noticeably different. Even pollen and plankton show an abrupt decrease both in size and diversity. In fact, three quarters of all life were wiped out in the days or weeks following that catastrophe. 
Global temperatures initially spiked as a result of the impact itself, broiling many animals alive for hundreds of miles around. And then the resulting ejecta of millions of tons of vaporized rock were shot into space where they cooled into liquid spheres and hardened again before plummeting back to the earth in the form of hundreds of millions of high velocity bullets strafing the whole world at once. As a cloud of iridium dust blanketed the planet along with the smoke from the fires and blocking out the sun for weeks or months, killing 60% of all plant species and 75% of animals. This prolonged period of darkness, choked in most areas by unbreathable dust, smoke and ash, and now suddenly freezing temperatures after the raging fires and torrential storms was only the final part of this tragedy of connected catastrophes. It wasn't much better in the ocean either, as many different species of marine life were gone. Even some that held on through the Permian-Jurassic extinction at the beginning of the Mesozoic couldn't make it through the end of that era. Ammonites, for example, were once among the most abundant organisms around, but not anymore. All the marine reptiles died out too, except for sea turtles, and probably because of the way their eggs are buried in the sand. The only land animals that made it through that event were those that could either hibernate for a long time or had very low demands on energy consumption or that had some other definite advantage, like, for example, birds were the only dinosaurs to survive and most of them didn't make it either. Only two lineages out of all that were known from that time made it out alive. These include the neonase, or modern birds, of course, and the paleonase, or relatively primitive birds, though not as primitive as what they used to be. Paleonase started with something like a tinamou, a tropical bird that could barely fly because they never had the keeled sternum to attach the heavy chest muscles that uh, give modern birds the power to flap their wings and fly as easily as some mammals can run. Unable to compete in that way, paleonase simply replaced some of the old dinosaurs by growing too big to fly and hopefully too big to mess with. As you saw in the last episode, most of the animals at that time were small enough to hide in their dens and wait out the storm, depending on where in the world they are. They may have been protected by natural systems or barriers well enough to sustain themselves underground or on short bursts into the wasteland, perhaps to eat the last of the dinosaurs' eggs or their helpless orphan hatchlings. Eventually, the ash settled and the smoke cleared and seasons resumed. New forests grew just without some of the old familiar plants and with a new variety that had just cropped up coincidentally at about the same time that snakes did. Grass quickly rooted in the ash and took over the land that was once dominated by forests of giant sequoias, now mostly toppled and replaced with the first plains and prairies. A new world emerges from the ruins of another as we begin Act 3 of Life on Earth, otherwise known as the Tertiary Period or the Cenozoic Era of Mammals. Back around Y2K, there was a Disney movie that rather beautifully depicted what this meteoric impact might have looked like if seen from, say, Western Cuba. Of course, the children's cartoon didn't show the scale of calamity that that would have to have created, but that's not the only thing that needed to be corrected. One of the many inaccuracies is that the story concerns a family of lemurs. Lemurs are the most primitive types of primates that still exist, but they didn't exist way back then. What they had back then was more basic than, and basal too, what we have now. This is an artist's depiction of Purgatorius. All four species of this genus are frustratingly only known from teeth. And the teeth indicate that it must belong to one of two taxonomic orders adjacent to each other within the clade Archonta, or Euarchonta if you prefer, which we covered in the previous episode. Some scientists are convinced that Purgatorius is the earliest known primate, but we'll have to see its skull to know for sure. The safest assumption is that Purgatorius is a plesiodapiform. And this order consists of 140 known species within 11 taxonomic families, many of which are known from skulls and postcranial skeletal remains, not just their teeth. And plesiodapiforms are entirely extinct now, but they're so similar to primitive primates that they might even be stem primates themselves. And most of them have claws, like you'd expect, but some of them had fingernails instead on opposable toes, which is a typical trait among primates. The only significant difference between primates and plesiodapiforms is that primates have at least a post-orbital bar, framing the socket of the eye. Now here's a lemur that has a post-orbital bar compared with a plesiodapiform that doesn't. The plesiodapiform is like some other mammals, uh, carnivorans for example, that just have their eyes sort of attached to the side of their brain case with no protective bone for the outside of the eyeball. 
but at least one carnivore does have that, and here's why. As we follow a lineage of vivarids westward from the Orient through India and into Africa, we can see a bony process begin to grow around and thicken to protect the eyeball. This is the post-orbital bar. If this happened within plesiodapiforms, then the ones that had that bar would be called primates because Arcanta plus that trait completes the criteria. Of course, primates followed this by also growing a cartilaginous septum, filling in the space behind the eye to make the basis of an eye socket. And this trait would be difficult to, to detect in fossils. And to my experience, most people who don't accept that they're animals usually don't have a problem admitting that they are mammals, if they know what the definition of that word is, even though that would logically mean that they're animals too. Even if they understand that as well, they may still draw a line at being a primate. But you know, if anybody wants to believe that they are the descendants of a primate, they are certainly welcome to do it. I don't know how far they will march that back. If you have a problem admitting that you're a primate, then this series is only going to get worse from here because it doesn't have to anything to do with what we want to believe. It's what we can show according to the criteria that we know. If you're able to understand and admit why you're a mammal and you accept the dozen or so classifications after that, including why you are archonted, then it should be easy enough to prove that you're a primate too. Just use your opposable thumbs to feel the postorbital bone right there beside your binocular eyes that line the sockets that have since fused to your skull. If you need more proof than that, keep watching this series and it'll keep coming.